tone versus performance. Let me share with you a conversation I had with Daniel Johnson right here in the comments section. Because if you're not obsessing over these things as a voiceover artist, maybe it's time you should be. You're listening to The Dangerous Mind of Mark Yoshimoto Nemkov. No excuses, no BS, no pants. All right, so Daniel Johnson left a really great comment, really well thought out, all right? I'm going to read this whole thing, and I'm going to read my response and then his response. All right, check this out. Our hearing is acutely sensitive to high mid information due to evolutionary survival. This is why the high mids and above are the only bands within the frequency spectrum laymen consider to be associated with clarity. This can be true if you don't get the low mids in order. Today's mics have so much low mid tuning in them because that's what people love hearing in the cans along with all the other resonances vibrating throughout their bodies that the mics need these ridiculous high mid high shelving peaks to balance out all the mud. Add to this comb filtering standing waves because people are doing VOs under blankets, improperly treated rooms, literal closets and booths the size of a pantry. A total shit show these days. Add the fact large caps have terrible off-axis response, which is what creates that added resonance, and people are literally eating the diaphragm to add even more low end. All this added low end energy is not only extremely expensive in regard to headroom, it also never translates over smart devices, which is how people even watch movies today. Don't get me started on that mess. This is what transformers do in a properly transformer coupled microphone, not a preamp, that makes them so very valuable. Contrary to popular belief, transformers don't add any low end except for the transformer ringing around the 40 Hz region, giving you a mild hump there. All that is rolled off anyway. When that core saturates, it squashes the low mids, but not any of the high mid transient detail. This is where the magic begins. While the low mids are getting squashed, you can still hear and more importantly feel those frequencies on nearly all playback devices. That's money, because now you have more headroom to push the gain if you wish. Also, the reduced energy in this area allows for the real meat of the human voice, low mids and mids, to slice through because you're no longer dealing with so much energy at the bottom, which renders the harsh shelving curves tuned into modern mics unnecessary. This is why the waveform of a transformer coupled mic looks compressed right from the start. Gorgeous. And that's what stands up in a mix with less fader riding, while also sounding a touch glued in already. You truly hear this at work at very low listening levels. But wait, there's more. Transformer ringing also occurs way up top, like 14 kHz and up, where all that lovely coveted air lives. If you put even the slightest peak up there with a shelf from any EQ, even planar stock plugs, you'll get unparalleled dimension. The voice sounds almost 3D, like the person is standing right in front of you, with a stellar preamp and AD, of course. Euphonious would work, and a perceived difference untrained ears will hear but can't place why it sounds so good, which doesn't matter to them. The biggest reason for the transformerless design push in mics especially is because high quality transformers have always been expensive to make. And they're not getting any cheaper. Plus when you remove the transformer, it allows you to make the full mic circuit surface mount, which is way cheaper than through hole boards, which is all done by hand. This wasn't a problem for manufacturers in the past because everyone wasn't an influencer, had a podcast, told they had a great voice, and worked for Audible. Now the sad truth. We're dealing with so many years of ear punishment as a society due to brick wall limiting, insanely tuned mics, horrible ADDA, dreadful recording spaces, people leaning on EQ and smartphones, that for many people, if it ain't loud and bright, it ain't right. Enter the 416, the worst mic imaginable for voice in an enclosed space at close proximity. Nails on a chalkboard. Yes, I said it. But, before I get beheaded in the comments, the 416 is the only affordable mic that does a good job of mimicking that transformer, low mid crunch, which does allow many people with insanely we need eat yesterday post-production schedules to be very lazy when it comes to mixing. But you better have one hell of a good de-esser if you care about bleeding eardrums because it wasn't designed to be used near field, which is why the shelf is there. But many don't care because it's loud and bright. Print it. Next, if you get in front of a transformer coupled mic, not many still being made except for a few, no not the 87, with a transformerless preamp and the equally critical and always overlooked high-end transparent AD, it will be the best sound you've had 
in your life. All right, I think that's an extremely well thought out comment. Now let me read you my reply. Okay. Daniel, thank you for that. I completely agree, except that the thickness we perceive in the low end of a transformer-based circuit is, I believe, typically due to hysteresis, causing a slight phase smear. But everything you describe speaks to tone, which is ultimately subjective in nature because not everyone responds to tone universally. Tone doesn't win auditions or keep clients rebooking you. The performance you capture does. And a good performance can be more easily recognized by the common listener than good tone. More so than ever, thanks to COVID forcing more sessions to be home-based, coupled with more people recording from questionably treated spaces, what is acceptable tone-wise is a wider swath than just even a couple years ago. As long as the performance is there, you can book work with bad tone. Now, now I'm not saying tone isn't important, but it's not and shouldn't be considered the most important aspect of crafting VOs that pay the bills. Sure, there are intangibles in how amazing tone can possibly evoke or enhance an emotional response, but at best, any subconscious benefit derived is just the cherry on top of a great performance. And honestly, I haven't seen any empirical evidence suggesting the importance of tone in VO, and any suggestion of such has to be seen as purely apocryphal in nature. We all want to sound like gods. We all want to be inspired by the sound of our own voices in our headphones. We all seek amazing tone. Personally, I've been on a VO tone quest for 10 years, but as I sit back and contemplate how many iterations of tone I've used over thousands of projects, some of that tone being regrettable in hindsight, I'm beginning to wonder if all I'm doing is chasing the tone dragon. Just from my personal experience, I've been complimented on my performances many multiples more than being complimented on my tone. Now, of course, again, this is singularly a VO-based viewpoint, as what a transformer can add euphonically in harmonic relation to music has far more potential to create an emotional response in the listener. The lion's share of my regular work is commercials, where I have 30 seconds to convince you to heed a call to action by convincing you it's the solution you need whether you knew it or not. In those few sentences, I have a tiny handful of moments where I can manipulate the emotions of the listener using vocal nuance. The more rooted and authentic feeling, whether it's an inflection, a vocal fry, or drawn-out syllable. The better chance I have to bullseye the entire VO, and, as it currently stands, I'm of the belief that a faster transient response and increased articulation aids the illusion that I'm the voice of your best friend, sitting across the table from you, telling you about something amazing. It's more intimate in a setting when we are peers, but if I need to be narrating to you, telling a story, and I'm speaking to you, not with you, the transformer sound, with its rounded transients and added largeness, aids in the illusion that I'm the dominant person where you should listen to me. More of an announcer than your best bud you're having beers with. Audiobooks, transformer sound. But for the kind of modern commercial where it's truly conversational, I think transformerless is the way I will continue to go. But it all goes to show the necessity of having several brushes in your paint jar, as not one brush or mic can properly cover the needs of all projects in today's vast VO landscape. And then I woke up this morning and I saw that Daniel had responded. This is great. Oh, for sure. In no way was I implying tone superseded performance. These days, what wins jobs is more political than anything, especially on a national level. They deliberately want VOs that sound real. I'm beginning to think that will soon mean no chops recorded on a cell phone, LOL. I was referring to tone because I thought that's where you were going with the video. And I commented because, like you, I have also been in this tone slash tube slash transformer slash transformerless slash small diaphragm slash large diaphragm slash short shotgun slash every pre-made battle, etc. forever. So I'm right there with you, <laughs> right? <laughs> he totally gets it. He totally gets it. And as audio people, it's an even worse affliction because we geek the hell out. <laughs> Damn right we do. I especially brought up low end because bass is what people associate with dominance, following pitch, of course. And I found Transformers tame that low end just enough to get you closer to a finished, albeit even deliverable tone out of the box, whereas sometimes Transformerless can be more in your face due to the fast transients. One of the biggest issues, in my opinion, since hardly anything is mixed anymore, is VO no longer sits in the mix like it used to. 
damn right. <sighs> Pulled back even, the term voiceover is taken too much literal, and the VO track is almost always too hot, especially in regional markets. National stuff still gets mixed a little, for now. You really hear this on demos. The contrast between the bed and VO track can also be felt as largeness, hard sell, aggressive, authority, etc., even if someone has a light, transient voice. There are, of course, many reasons why aversion to any type of authority slash dominance, i.e. announcer, in our society is commonplace today. And a book could be written on that alone. But I think it's a real problem in our industry because in the last 15 years or so, they're attempting to correct what's clearly a post-production problem by pulling back performances so much, they're lifeless or so saccharine. Everyone can smell the cell. Because when you listen to commercials today, the VOs still don't sound real. That announcer format is always there. It also may be because there isn't much storytelling in ads these days. But what it really is, the anti-announcer thing, is simply a passive way of saying, we don't want anyone that sounds old. But I totally get what you mean. My mainstay is a U89 near field with a Shep's small diaphragm midfield. The 89 got such a raw deal historically, but it's still Neumann's best effort to date, in regard to just tone. I think the closer one gets to location dialogue, the more that will play with the principal actors in the commercial. And that aesthetic, performance aside, is what many identify as real. Like it's all part of the same setting. That match, of course, was the entire reason the 416 made its way into the booth for ADR. Tragic. That and good old Ernie Anderson. LOL. Daniel, you are so on point with your, with basically the way, <laughs> what I hear going on, the obsession of getting the right sound is exactly what you need to have in your mind. The storm brewing in your mind, the maelstrom going on in your mind as a VO artist. That's exactly what you need to be thinking. All these points. This is such a great conversation. So I just wanted, I really, I, re, I felt very compelled to, to, to share this with you in case you hadn't seen it on the previous video. So what do you think? What do you obsess about? Tone, performance, something else? Your gear? Everything. You need to obsess about everything in VO. Or you're not doing it right. <laughs> right. Okay. Let me know what you think. Until next time, this is Mark Yoshimoto Nemkov, Fading to Black.